could do it at 7.30, and I'd like to get started. Uh, again, welcome to the, the April edition of the Hearst Civil Roundtable Zoom meetings. And again, tonight we're going to get uh, Randy, who's here with us, and his topic is William Kempton, the man behind the camera, and how he influenced again his word battlefield. And what I'd like to do is just like a few short announcements, but just to get started, uh, get this thing to work for me. Well, I like this. Everybody stand and we will do the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. The United States of America. To the Republic for which it stands. Which it stands. One nation, nation under, God, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you guys very much. One of these days I'm going to get the Red Scout one in here. Okay, just a, a few little notes on the Zoom meeting. Uh, if you would uh, mute your audio, and what we can do at the end when I'm done talking, I also have the mute all button, and then I'll, I'll put uh, Randy on. But if you mute uh, during the talk, and then at the end, if you have questions, either put it on chat or at the end of the at the, at the end of Randy's talk, just unmute yourself and ask him the question. Uh, the other one is your video. It's sort of you can leave it on if you want. Remember. What you see, we can, if, you're, if you're eating shower or something, we will see it. <laughs> and I said, if you have any questions at the end, uh, either ask it, unmute yourself and ask it. And the other one, uh, we, we have got permission from Randy and we are recording this. And a couple of days afterwards, uh, you'll be on our, on our website, which is you know, Hershey Civil War Roundtable, HerseyCWRT.org, and they'll be ready to go. And just a reminder for those uh, who haven't applied yet, we do have the 2001 membership application available. You can also get it online or contact me. We also have a set where you can actually pay the app. You, you can pay your uh, dues online. And it's, it's uh, I'm not sure through PayPal, but it's, it's secure. So if you pay, you uh, it's, just, it's secure in line. Also, we're looking for uh, sponsors, even though this year we won't have a brochure out. But just to help, you know, uh, pay from the expenses for the speakers. And one good thing uh, we found out: April twenty third and twenty fourth is the second annual Lincoln Funeral Train uh, commemoration. Uh, now it says the twenty third and twenty fourth, but actually the twenty third is for VIPs, and that's all sold out. Uh, and so the, they're all available on the twenty on fourth, and that's from eleven to seven. And we are going to have a, a table out there for, uh, for the Hershey Civil Roundtable. And I will have a few bits of information for the, uh, the Harrisburg and also for the Camp Curtain uh, at, our, at our table. So you want to put that on your calendar. The only requirement that they're doing is anybody that goes to this uh, event, it is uh, NASCA required, which is so far still pretty much standard for everybody. And let me go back here. What we'll do now, I'm going to take myself off and then Randy, the show's all yours. All right. First of all, thank you all for inviting me back. It's been several years, but it's always a pleasure to, to speak before roundtables, including and especially the local ones such as yours. I enjoyed it the last time, and I am looking forward to doing this program, which is one of my favorites. They're all my favorites, but this one has more of a personal connection uh, in more ways than one, which we'll get into. Uh, we all know a little bit about William H. Tipton. I'm sure we've all heard about him and seen his photographs, at least some of them. The second portion of this program will be a series of photographs that you have probably not seen, and we'll see how far we get through them towards the end of the program. But that's an extra feature. Uh, Ricky has it. He can share that with the uh, club as well. So there's two photographs of William H. Tipton in his, in his younger days and obviously his older days. I like the one on the right the most. His nickname was Boss. Boss Tipton. When you think of Boss Tweed in New York politics, this gentleman here was also involved with Borough Council, so he was a politician in his own right. And uh, I just love that photograph. 
And uh, before we get going here, I just wanted to, as you peruse that screen regarding his, his background, this program came about through a friend of mine who was a licensed town guide and had been discussing a photograph, which you will see later in the program. She had mentioned that she knew two of uh, uh, William H. Tipton's descendants who still lived in the Gettysburg area, and she invited me and a few others over to that house where I met Louise Tipton Maines, her husband, and her brother, Charlie Tipton. That's how I got to learn more about the uh, history of Charlie, uh, Charlie and Louise and William H. Tipton and got these no, photographs and were the impetus for this program. I put it together and I shared it with Louise Tipton Maines and Charlie Tipton Maines before I did it officially. And the first time I did it was at the Gettysburg Heritage Center several years ago. Uh, so again, this is one of my uh, favorite ones. My ancestor who was wounded at Gettysburg and returned in 1883, really? actually worked for William H. Tipton for a uh, short time. I don't know much more about that, but I have that family connection to William H. Tipton, which I did not know until about 20 years ago. So with that little background about how I got this program together, let's start with the fact. All right, as you can see on the screen, William H. Tipton was born in Gettysburg. Uh, and I won't read the whole of thing. Um, instead of driving out the there. farm that they grew up in yeah, is still it's, on it's Hanover it's Road. It's still there. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit dilapidated, but the location is still there. And uh, his formal education was extremely limited. And he often stated he graduated with honors from the School of Hard Knocks. And as you probably know, he studied photography as an apprentice with Charles and Isaac Tyson, one of the earliest Gettysburg photographers. And uh, at the age of 13, he was actually involved uh, on the battlefield, um, assisting with taking the photographs that T Tyson brothers uh, took. Back then, there were no real copyright uh, laws. So there was an issue later on that Although it was legal, a lot of the photographs that William H. Tipton would provide and sell and share were technically photographs from Charles Tyson. Um, so that's just a little bit of a, a background on the history. He produced over 5,000 views of the battlefield and they were given by Charlie Tyson uh, to the park uh, in 1935. When I met Louise Tipton Maines and Charlie Tipton, they were so gracious that in addition to seeing some of the items you see in the program, they also gave each one of us a DVD with about 4,000 photographs. And uh, very, very blessed to have that opportunity. Um, we'll continue here. Uh, we all know about his photography at Gettysburg, but a lot of people forget that he photographed Antietam, Harper's Ferry, Fredericksburg, Petersburg, Spotsylvania, and Chancellorsville. As I mentioned earlier, he served on town council and was elected to the state legislature and worked on Teddy Roosevelt's campaign. He died in 1929 and is interred in Evergreen Cemetery along with his family. This is the amazing story of William H. Tipton and how he influenced the battlefield. Okay, as we had talked about the, uh, the gallery of Charles and Isaac Tyson, the Tyson brothers, was called uh, Excelsior Gallery and uh, moved to the second floor of the building, the brick building 
at 33 York Street, which we all are familiar with. It has the old time uh, ice cream shop in it and it has that cannonball in the uh, brick facade below the second floor window. Um, the Tysons were uh, advertising for an apprentice and they also had learned about William H. Tipton's skill at drawing and contacted him and got him as an apprentice. Uh, again, as I mentioned a minute ago, they quickly acquired him shortly after the end of the battle and started photographing with his assistants. And his apprenticeship lasted three years. And at the conclusion of which he was paid a sum of, are you ready for this? $175. When the partnership of Tyson Brothers dissolved, where Charles bought out Isaac, Tipton became the manager of the studio. And then in 1868, Tipton formed the partnership with a fellow employee, Robert Myers and then bought out, they bought out Charles Tyson. Then it was called the new business, Tipton and Myers. But in 1873, Tyson bought out Myers and the new name of the photography was William H. Tipton and Company. So you can see he was a very smart businessman. There are the Tyson brothers. And this is a photograph of William H. Tipton driving the, the Tyson Brothers dark room wagon. And we all know what building that is, don't we? Meets headquarters, the Leicester Farmhouse. These are some of the advertisements that he would provide uh, to promote his business. Call upon or write to me for anything and everything in the way of photographs and lantern slides of the battlefield of Gettysburg, monuments, guidebooks, maps, souvenir albums, miniature monuments, and tourist novelties. Just about sums it all up. His original office was number three Chambersburg Street, which we'll get into, but then later moved due to space to 20 and 22 Chambersburg Street. These are some of the book plates. This is an advertisement. This is the book plate. And as I just mentioned, he moved to the 20 and 22 Chambers Berg Street, remodeled to provide all the modern day facilities for a prosperous photography business with each story of the building devoted to a separate task. An article in the Littlestown Independent newspaper in 1888 stated, and as you can read, the sales room contains the largest plate glass window in Gettysburg and numerous cabinets and cases with etchings, engravings, engravings. Every room in the house is connected by speaking tubes. That reminds me of the old ships. Second floor is devoted to operating, finishing, and chemical manipulations. I like the word manipulations. The skylight reception and toilet rooms are on this floor, while the finishing room, mailing, and packing departments are in the back. Third floor is devoted to exclusively to printing, washing, and toning operation, and the manufacture of the slides. There's also a separate fireproof building that he had in the back of the building uh, at 20 and 22 Chambersburg Street, where he stored the negatives and supposedly systematically arranged so any specific negative could be found in less than five minutes. His photography grew in fame and in size. His mail order department was shipping to every state as well as Canada, England, Russia, India, Australia. And it was reported that the postage costs exceeded any other, other business in the United States. That's a big contributor to the postal system, I would say. There are the two buildings. I'm assuming 
this is the plate glass window. Maybe they made it into two later, uh, later years, but I'm assuming that is the plate glass window, the largest one. Here's a photograph from inside. We make Stipton at work. Other employees. These are stacks of the photograph catalog, which I'll show one of them to you that I have that I received from my grandmother years and years ago. And a little detail, General Meade. I can't quite make out what these are. This is the fireproof facility in the back, which is still there. And here are just some of the stereoscope slides. We all know that one. The Trossel farm with the horses. This is the one that they call unfit for service, which they're pretty sure they know is facing west Emmertsburg Road. I can't quite make this one out, but it gets you an idea that they did not just the single slides, but the stereotypes. And here's another example of the cemetery. Eighteen eighty two. My grandmother had one of them. How many of you have one of those or have seen one? All right, so as we all know, or probably heard about Tipton Park, William H. Tipton's Business Park uh, and Photography Studio uh, on the battlefield in the area across from Devil's Den. It's about 13 acres, which we'll see a map in a little bit. But again, Tipton was a shrewd businessman. He already, he bought the building, seen on the bottom right corner. That was owned by photographer Levi Mumper, another local photographer. But William H. Tipton, I'm not sure the whole story of Levi Mumper and why he sold out. Maybe he was tired. Maybe he just couldn't make a go of it with the competition. But William H. Tipton did not build that. He bought that. And then later, when uh, the eminent domain issue came into play and they removed the uh, electric trolley and the Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railroad and all the other inconveniences, quote unquote, this uh, building was moved to the upper edge, northern slope of Little Round Top and operated by Blind Davy Weikert. And that's another story we'll save for another day. But this gives you an idea of the map of the park and Tipton Park itself. There's the Devil's Den. There's a little bit better map of it. See about 12 acres. Devil's Den right here. The electric railway, very conveniently located to his photography studio. His park, Tipton Park, had boundary markers in conjunction to the ones that the park had. And three of the markers that he had, Tipton, had a T on it. So if you're out on the battlefield and there's only three of them out there in that vicinity marking his boundary, if you don't know about William H. Tipton and Tipton Park, you would think this is a very unusual blank marker or a very strange boundary marker of some sort. But now you know the T is for Tipton. I did a special tour 
with licensed barrel fuel guide Phil Lechak years ago on trolleys, trains, and parks within the park and invited Alan and Louise Tipton Mains along. And they did not know about these T markers at all. They'd never heard of that. And this is one photograph of her, Louise Tipton Mains, proudly smiling and finally realizing that there is and has found one of the T markers that you've just seen in the slide above. Here's another photograph of the photography studio. That's the 40th New York, the Mozart Regiment. Just gives you one of the fewer photos that you see of it, the studio. Uh, this is basically the trolley line. Tipton Park is over to the right. The studio is to the right. This is one of the famous photographs of the famous trough rock. The studio is the building to the right. The water was used also not only for horses, but by William H. Tipton for his photography development processes, the chemicals. Uh, and so that's why the, the trough was important for two reasons. I love this photograph. These two dapper gentlemen. James T. Long is a gentleman on the right, one of the first battlefield guides, and William H. Tipton. All right, so we had mentioned a little bit about the Gettysburg Electric Railway, i.e. the trolley line. It was founded by Edward Hoffer, a farm equipment salesman from Hummelstown, who wanted to provide benefits of electric power to Gettysburg, while also conducting and constructing a trolley line to get people to the battlefield. Hoffer received a grant and approval from the state and put in 10,000 of his own money after being uh, officially approved. About a year later, the railway with the approval of the residents and support of the residents for tourism, obviously, most notably William H. Tipton, who was very influential and on the member of the borough council at the time, and also having his studio down there, obviously wanted to support the trolley line to get tourists down to his studio. Um, as you can see, the construction began in April of 90, 1893. Tracks were planned along the high water mark, but opposition by veterans of the 72nd PA forced the trolley route to be changed despite the uh, attempts by Tipton to negotiate with the veterans. Many of the laborers were employed to build a trolley line in the temporary housing in the Devil's Den area on land owned by Tipton. Uh, October 95, the trackage was laid total length 8.5 miles with seven stops, including one at Tipton Park. So again, Tipton was a very shrewd and influential businessman. There's a photograph of one of the trolleys. There were seven trolleys. They were all named for seven, the seven Union Army Corps commanders can't quite make out which one that one is, but they were all, there's some photographs that you can see the name of the trolley. Unfortunately, this building, the power generating station is no longer there in town, but that would have been, that would be one beautiful building to see if it was still here. But that was the source of the generation of the electric for the town and the power lines for the trolley. Again, that was north of town on the northwest side. Here's a map of not only the trolley line in the blue, the red is what was 
planned by uh, William H. Tipton, but as we mentioned, it's right in front of the bloody angle and the 72nd PA objected and it was never built. This section was used by both the trolley and the Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railroad, which had their stop at the northern slope of Little Round Top. And they had their park called Round Top Park. As you can see, when they were talking about planning the route, there's a 72nd PA monument, the uproar, uh, grew because these photographs were published in newspapers and all the veterans, no matter who they were, were very upset about destroying the terrain that they fought over. This is just another one showing the proposed route. There's a loop in the wheat field. There's the wheat field. The trolley line. This is a more familiar photograph. Right along the Emmitsburg Road. That's the Klingel Farm. There are the tracks, overhead line. There's another view of the fame, one of the, the famous or one of the infamous or famous monuments with the farm upraised. I believe that's 11th, 11th of Massachusetts, if, I correct, if I'm correct. This is from the summit of Devil's Den. Looking down into the Valley of Death, little round top. Look how open it was. Still is now, mostly. But this photograph shows you the trolley line and the telephone, the power line pole. The next two slides you see photographs from. Uh, the battlefield, different areas showing the trolley line in action. There's another one of the trolley line. This is behind Little Round Top. This is after they took the, the, the trolley line out. This is the Abraham Bryan farm in the photo. Ziegler's Grove. And in the spring and fall, if you go down in that area, you can still see the depression of what the trolley, where the trolley line used to be. And there's another version of the trolley line where it used to be looking north towards town. Just the opposite view. All right, now here's where it gets really interesting. William H. Tipton has his photography studio, Tipton Park, very successful. But because of the trolley line and the opposition by the veterans with the destruction of the battlefield, it's not going very well when the veterans come back for the reunions or the dedication of their monuments. And in one particular instance, it really comes to a head. July 3rd, 1893, on the top, a little round top. At the dedication of the castle monument to the 12th and 44th New York Infantry, General, former General and now Congressman Dan Sickles and former Chief of Staff to me, Dan Butterfield, and a lot of veterans were there uh, for the dedication of the monument to the New York troops and such. And they noticed William H. Tipton coming up the slope with his camera, intending to take a picture of the events, which he had done at a lot of the dedications of the monuments 
um, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen many of them online or on Facebook or where, where, wherever. Um, because of the unhappiness over the trolley line and how the uh, battlefield terrain had changed and the quote unquote desecration of the battlefield itself, the soldiers tipped their heads. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, they turned their heads, wouldn't allow them to take the pictures of their faces. Tipton walked up the hill all the way up to the top and with his camera and lugging his camera up, said, what are you doing? And I just want to take a picture of the, the monument and the dedication. And Butterfield says, no, you're not taking any pictures of us. And by whose orders? And Tipton uh, is told by orders of Butterfield and Sickles. And at that time, things start to get a little rowdy. Some of the crowd uh, became agitated and said things like, take your machine out of the way, meaning the camera. Another one threatened that if Tipton refused to move his camera, we'll come with and you down the hill with it. But before he could muster a response, however, the veterans made good on their promise. Two or three New York veterans pushed Tipton's camera and Tipton down the hill rendering it broken and unfit for use. Now, after collecting himself and the camera up, Tipton made a mock bow and returned to his studio and then ended up suing General Sickles for $10,000, seeking damages for him and the camera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we know how Sickles can be, and he just blew it off. And the following day at a meeting of the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association, Congressman Sigels announced his intentions to bring about the adoption of the land for the National Park. So in essence, Tipton helped in the creation inadvertently of the National Park. And that park system National Park, military park system as well know, also preserved Antietam, Shiloh, Vicksburg, Chickamauga, Chattanooga, et cetera, et cetera. And again, it's ironic that his actions in promoting the trolley line and as an attempt to uh, photograph the monument dedication ultimately helped lead to the demise of the studio and the trolley line. And it was the first time after the law was signed in the law that the federal government used the power of eminent domain, removing the trolley line, the Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railroad, any building that they felt unfit for the battlefield, including the studio. All right, so we talk, we've talked about his photographs and we've talked about um, Tipton Park and the creating, creation of the battlefield. The other important aspect that Tipton played a role in was the cyclorama. Uh, he assisted and was hired by Philip, Philip Pateau, uh to create the famous painting. He had uh, assistants. They created a wooden platform and drew a circle around it 80 feet in diameter and divided it into 10 sections. Tipton then took three photographs of each section focusing in turn on the foreground, the background, and the horizon. And then these photographs pasted together form the basis of the composition known as the cyclorama painting. So we've seen a lot of these photographs, but a lot of people may not realize that they were from that tower, that platform. And that's the Godori Farm, Emmitsburg Road, probably one of the assistants of Philip Pateau to give depth of field and scale. This is just another view from the platform looking north towards Ziegler Grove. Another one, this in, to the south. Actually, it's to the west, I'm sorry. 
uh, Wolf's Hill, Power, uh, Wolf Hill, Power Hill, just the exact opposite from that other photograph, but the one with the, the horseman. Another familiar photograph looking south, big round top in the background. There's the artist Phil, Phil Pateau painting the famous cyclorama. And we all know he's, he painted himself in the uh, cyclorama painting itself. And we all know that the original cyclorama was housed and completed just in time for the 1913 reunion. Uh, and that original cyclorama, as we all know, is where the water tower is on Cemetery Hill at the bend in the road, Steinware Avenue. Now, just briefly, we'll talk about the, the family. There's a famous photograph of William H. Tipton in his older years. When uh, Louise Tipton Maines and her family allowed us to visit the house, and then when she came to the PowerPoint program that I did at the Gettysburg Heritage Center. She brought along where he makes Tipton's cane there, seen on the right, and other items such as a book plate from his library. She brought along this framed collection of his artifacts that he found on the battlefield. Very kind of her. And this leads to a very interesting story which Ricky knows already. This is the Tipton family Bible, which Louise Tipton Maines has. And if you read that, if you can read it, it says William Henry Tipton, born August 5th, 1850. Licensed battlefield guide, Tim Smith, wrote a very nice booklet on uh, William H. Tipton, and when Louise saw it and read it, she called or emailed him and thanked him for doing such a great job on the book about his her ancestor. But she said, there's one thing wrong. You have his middle name as Howard in the book. It's Henry. And she said, the family Bible even has it. Well, he says, I got it from a newspaper article when he quoted the newspaper article where he, re he refers to William H. Tipton as William Howard. And she said, but the Bible has it clearly, William Henry Tipton. Tim Smith said to Louise, your family Bible is wrong. All right, and I'll just let it go at that. Tim and I are friends, uh, but we'll just let it go at that, okay? This is just the, the marriage certificate. That's his wife. One daughter. Beulah Tipton is seen in a lot of photographs, especially the one here in that attire in a lot of the photographs, which I'm assuming he put William H. Tipton used her for depth of scale. That's her uh, later age. And we, Ricky and I were talking about this one. This is Beulah. This is the rock at the intersection of Wheatfield Road and Crawford Avenue. That's little round top, big round top. Wheatfield Road would be going this way. Crawford Avenue is, is right here on the right. This is right in the intersection and it's still there. I sent Ricky photographs, so if he wants to share with the, the round table, uh, that'd be very helpful. It's just, I uh, just don't have it in the PowerPoint. Now, this is the one that got everybody intrigued at the very beginning. Again, this is Beulah. This is the manu monument to General Samuel Zook on Wheatfield Road, looking south. There's the round top. But the monument is only this tall. 
So the only thing we can figure out is with the camera lenses back then, it sometimes would throw perspective out. We have no other no other explanation as to why that appears that huge, but it is definitely not that tall. Even that photograph there shows it as way too tall. This is the, the uh, George Spangler farm that the park has where they had the hospital, field hospital for um, the 11th Corps. And they took General Confederate General Lewis Armistead there after his wounding, mortal wounding on July 3rd. But that's Beulah Tipton. You can sort of see the hat. So she's in a lot of photographs. Now this is Tyson and her brother on the right, Charles Tyson and her. But he also appears in a few photographs, including this famous photograph of Trough Rock. So unless you have photographs of Charles Tyson at his younger age, you would not know who this gentleman was in the photograph. But now you do. This more of his family. This is the back of the house at 20 and 22 Chambersburg Street. That's the brick building with the uh, fireproof building for the uh, glass plate negatives. A family photo. Wondering who took the photo. All right, that concludes that program. How much, we have a few minutes to go through some additional slides. Rick? You asked a question. Yeah, yeah, we, we still have about 15 minutes left. All right, I'm watching, I'm watching the clock, okay? Okay. All right, let me back out of this one to see if I can pull up the other one. Can you see it now? Yeah, we got it. Oh, no, not yet. All right, let me see if I get the new share. Yeah, just take this share off and put the new one up. Yeah, is it up now? Yeah, you got the old truck. Okay, let me go up one slide. There you go. All right, well, because of time, this has 138 slides. Again, these are all courtesy of Louise Tipton Mains. Um, but I think some of them you'll find very interesting. Again, as Rickley, Ricky had talked before, he loves that truck. That's the old, that's the maintenance building. Yeah. Hey, Randy, just yes. real quick, and what we'll do, you've sent me the other pictures. So one of these times, are, when we go live or something, we, we can show the picture. So go ahead. I'm sorry, say again. What, uh, if you, but you don't have time, you give me those other slides. So somewhere down the road, when we get a chance to meet together and live with, with, with our group, I'll have the pictures available to, so they can see it. Okay. All right. Because you have both PowerPoint programs. Yes, I do. Okay. Got it. All right. This is the Leicester Farmhouse with descendants of General Meade. 19, is that, uh, it's not, I don't see the year. I see the slide number. This is a photograph down at Devil's Den. And what's interesting to me is that that's the only photograph I've ever seen of a, a black man in the Tipton photographs. And I hope that doesn't upset anybody, me pointing that out but it's just something different that you don't normally see. 
This is the Black Horse Tavern. Uh, at that time, it was owned by Francis Breen. That's uh, the Breen family. I love the photograph here. The boy's like, will you please take the photo? I want to go out and play. She doesn't look too happy either. And he's like, okay. So some things never change when it comes to getting family photographs, right? This is in the, the inside of the L Lydia Leister farmhouse. Another one inside. This is the famous Farnsworth house. It was the blacksmith, the home of the blacksmith. Uh, uh, I want to say William Sweeney. I could be wrong, but it's S-W-E-N-E-Y. Another photograph. This is a photograph of Thaddeus Stevens' home on Chambersburg Street. It's still there, and there's a wayside marker in front of the house. This is an interesting one because we don't really have much information on other than it's a log house at 13 Steinmore Avenue. You see two children in the photograph, but there's no documentation as to who owned it at the time. And then I haven't really looked at the Adams County Historical Society records to see who might have owned it at the time. But I guess he's just showing how there was still at least log, log houses back at that point. In, in history. This is one you don't normally see. That building is long gone, but we all recognize this, don't we? General Buford, General Reynolds, Emmitsburg, uh, uh, Chambersburg Pike. It was the Shields Museum and Souvenir Stand around 1920. This is a rock carving that no one has found. It's very possible that the rock was taken out when they put in Geary Avenue uh, on the lower slope of Little Round Top, uh, uh, Culp's Hill, and just north of Spangler's uh, Spring. It's Thomas Holston, Baltimore. But what's interesting is how they were carved. It's not the way you normally see the carvings. It looks like you did it with little simple marks, each and every one. That had to have taken some time. But I have not found anything on Thomas Holston, Baltimore. This is just a nice photograph showing how open West Confederate Avenue was. Obviously, the Long Street Tower looking north east, west, west Confederate Avenue up further north, uh, closer to 116. You can see the style fencing. There's a photograph just further down from there, just a short distance, showing the Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railway. The trains were used by the U.S. Army in World War I to supply Camp Colt. And remember, they didn't take out the Harrisburg, Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railway until uh, much later, 19, uh, 1895 or so, because of the eminent domain rule in Congress. Um, they had that. They had that train there for a lot longer than that. There's a one photograph we've said before. This is North Confederate Avenue. Looking towards the Forney House. This is the Brickyard Lane. You don't normally see that one. That's, you know, East Cemetery Hill. Sedgwick Monument. They once had a roundabout, a cul-de-sac, however you want to call it, a little toolbox. Virginia Monument, before they had the details and statuary on. 
That's one of the old guard shacks. There were five guard shacks on the battlefield at one time. This is from the PA monument looking uh, south. I'm sorry, east. There's the monument to the engineers. This would be Cemetery Ridge, Cemetery Avenue. This is from the Pennsylvania Monument again. This is the 84th New York. This is Pleventon Avenue. That's the US, um, I think that's the US regulars there. That shows you Harrow Avenue, which was taken out in the years later. Again, from the PA Monument, looking northwest. This is the split. Pleasanton Avenue, Hancock Avenue coming up. Fitzhugh's Battery. They moved the monument, but the flank markers are still there. The monument is up near the Copse of Trees. This monument. There's the Manus building. This is looking south. Cemetery Hill, you see the fencing and the way they delineated the road with the cannonballs on top, trolley line in Cemetery Hill. This is a Granite Schoolhouse Lane, uh, one of the batteries, Heathens, I believe. The cannons are no longer there, but the Monument is. This is East Cemetery Hill. This is Brickyard Lane on the right. This is Wainwright Avenue. Look at the elaborate fencing they had there at one time. This is looking north. What I like here is this shows Tony Town Road and it had a divided highway at one time, in essence. There's Powers Hill. See how open it was between here and Culp's Hill. But that's Powers Hill in the background. This is Culp's Hill. Shows you down to the 66th Ohio. When the cars became popular, they became uh, sort of dangerous to drive down these roads like this. Even with these markers to mark the edge of the road and they end up taking the road out. So that's one of the roads that has been removed. This is McKnight's house, that's Sloke, uh, Stevens Avenue. This shows you the old wooden tower that was there on East Cemetery Hill, the Lunettes, Stevens Knoll, this is Pleasanton Avenue looking uh, northeast. That house is there, still there today. This shows you the guard shack at the Virginia Monument. The size of little is a little deceptive. They are only and were only six foot by eight foot. There is a monument or a cement slab to the, mon uh, the guard shack on Little Round Top. It's still there and it measures six foot by eight foot. This is Wheatfield Road. This is Devil's Den uh, to the left. As you can see this little pond, a nice pond. That's the soldiers uh, veteran, the orphan's home. The famous split there with the 23rd 26 Pennsylvania Emergency Militia. The Dobbin House. The old compiler. 
Everybody know what Penelope is, the cannon that the Democrats would fire off after an election and it eventually ruptured. So they ended up putting it in the sidewalk for some reason. But this was either the Democratic headquarters or they just celebrate outside the newspapers you see we're getting the results of the election. This is listed as showing one of the water troughs that General Ewell watered his whole horse from. This is from the Oak Hill Tower looking towards town. And you can see the railroad, Gettysburg and Ashbury Railroad. That's a cemetery. And you know the park put that back in a few years ago, the entrance. Water tower from Camp Colt on Emmitsburg Road near the Ziegler's Grove. This is showing Mead Avenue, which was taken out. This is from Pennsylvania Monument and uh, not Pennsylvania Monument, from uh, Oak Hill. Not too, I'm getting tired. Um, Ziegler's Grove, but this is Web Ab uh, Mead Avenue that was taken out. That was a big uh, flagpole near the Leicester House on Web uh, Mead Avenue. Here's another view. That's a pretty tall flagpole. From the railroad cut, when the US government opened up the rules for allowing containers to be double stacked on railroad cars, the park then had to redo the uh, height for the bridge. That's the 107th PA looking west. Shows you how open uh, Pickett's charge was to the north near Long Lane. That's a view looking west. There's one of the good photographs of the high water mark. That's Webb Avenue with the Lewis Emmons Armistead Rooney marker. Webb Avenue was, take, was taken out in the 60s, 1960s. That's a photograph of the Hancock Rooney marker. That's the first Vermont uh, brigade on Wright Avenue. Another view. That's the intersection of Tonytown Road looking across the Howe Avenue and how open how Avenue was looking north towards town and the Union Line. Another view. This shows you the breastworks, Stevens Knoll, the Union breastworks. And again, another view. This is the last one we'll stop at. This shows you the, the wooden tower this is from Stevens Knoll. This is Wainwright Avenue over here. This is the monument to the 33rd Massachusetts. But somewhere along the line, you, uh, I don't know, I haven't really found any information out. But it moved, they moved it. So if, if you had not seen the old photograph, the prior photograph, you would not know that that was moved. And it doesn't look like the road changed. So with that, that gives you an idea of some of the many lesser known photographs. You guys have a copy of it. Feel free to share with your members and take your time looking at them. I have 138 in that PowerPoint. So and we only scratched the surface. All right, so we wanna unmute. How do I get out of this to answer any well, questions? You can just leave that there. Um, okay. And like I say, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and, and ask the question. It's awful quiet. Oh, hey, one question. When did electricity, like for the, for the uh, trolleys, come to Gettysburg? Around 1885. Okay. Now, how do I get out of this to show you those two items I mentioned earlier? Uh, just unshare. 
just do so. Uh, what do I hear? Hang on a second. Oh, stop share. Stop share. There oh. we go. All right, let's try it now. That one photograph in the office of uh, William H. Tipton on 20 and 22 Chambersburg Street, where you saw that stack of those booklets of photographs that he was selling, mail order and wherever. Um, I'm sure down at the studio and in his office as well. My grandmother had one, and I still have it. Yeah. One of my prized possessions. And I was given a gift a few years ago. And I have one of his glass plate negatives. This is of the um, 41st Pennsylvania plaque on the PA monument. So I told Ricky, I'm going to go on eBay tonight and just see how much this thing's worth. But uh, again, like I said, uh, I enjoyed this program because I have that connection, which I didn't know until 20 years ago. But my ancestor actually worked for William H. Tipton. And uh, it's been a pleasure working and learning with Louise Tipton Maines and her brother, Charlie, and uh, sharing the history of his family and Tipton and how he's influenced the battlefield in more ways than one. Thank you all again. One question I had is uh, Blind Davy Walker? Yes, Weikert, yes. Okay. He yes, was, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. So, uh, you have information on him and what about it? I'm not, I'm, I'm familiar with that. Okay. Uh, Rosensteel had a big studio, uh, not a studio, he had like a, a souvenir shop there on the northern slope of Little Round Top where the intersection is near the, the restrooms are now, the Jiffy Johns. On the right side of the road would have been Tipton, uh, the uh, railroad park that they had. But before that, they had, and, part, and during the same time, they had this little, uh, stand, souvenir stand. Rosa, uh, Rosensteel owned it. Blind Davy Weikert um, worked it. He said he was wounded in the battle and that's how he lost his eyesight. But actually he was involved with the construction of the trolley line and there was a mistake of some sorts when the dynamite went off at one point and that's how he lost his eyesight. But he would tell people that he was a veteran and that's how he lost his eyesight. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Steve, just want a quick one on your, your meeting now uh, next week? Uh, yes. Uh, the Harrisburg Civil War Roundtable meets uh, next Friday, not tomorrow night, but next week. Uh, our speaker will be Eric Wittenberg, uh, who... Uh, co-authored the, uh, the leading book on Lee's retreat from Gettysburg, along with J.D. Petruzzi, who served as our field trip guide in 2018. So we have an opportunity to, having walked the train a few years ago, we have an opportunity now to hear from the uh, co-author of that book, a very celebrated cavalry historian. Um, and uh, I urge everybody to, to tune in uh, next, next Friday night at seven o'clock. 6.45 to, to get in before start time. Uh, and, and you're all cordially invited to, to join us. Also a reminder that the uh, AHEC is having, in Carlisle is having its uh, big book sale of the year. 95% of what they have uh, uh, available on Saturday is brand new. Well, I mean, it's used, but it's brand new. Uh, it, it's not stuff that you've picked over a, a dozen times before on the trolleys outside their bookstore. They've been saving it up for this. Also, that same day, they'll be selling off 
as an estate sale, uh, Dr. Dick Summers' uh, miniature tin soldier collection, which is enormous. Uh, and uh, whether you're interested in, in uh, miniature soldiers or not, it's really something to go see. Um, that's on Saturday uh, from starting at 10 o'clock um, and uh, goes on until th the soldier sale goes on till three, the book sale till 4.30. Book sale also goes on uh, Sunday from 12 to 4.30. So there's a lot going on here in the next week and uh, hope, uh, hope to see some of you there. Okay, thanks, Dave. Uh, just to close out, uh, our next meeting is going to be May the 20th. We just found out we have to have a change in speakers. We're working on that because we found out Chris has just been sent. He's going to be somewhere in the middle, up in the air on the 20th of May, but uh, we've already got a couple of people we're working on to fill that to fill that slot, and we'll keep you guys all informed. But our next meeting is going to be May 20th. So if there's no other questions, uh, thank everybody for showing up. And Randy, uh, great talk. Like I said, I do have a copy of the slides. So if anybody wants to, to see them, let me know. I, would it be okay if I send them to them? Yes, by all means. Okay, and then at the next meeting, I, I could do like a little run on PowerPoint that we could run it at the very beginning so people could see the pictures and it okay. won't interfere with, with the meeting. That should be like 2024. <laughs> <laughs> okay, again, thank you very much, Randy. I appreciate it and uh, wish everybody a, a great weekend and just a little early and uh, we'll see you all next month. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, all. Thank you. Oh, right. Now y'all can make.